it is important that our study results are sufficiently reliable. Also, it is important to be able to argue reliability based on empirical data. So how exactly do we assess reliability and how exactly we argue that our results are reliable. Before we go into that, there is one thing that I want to address uh, called rules of thumb, particularly with respect to reliability and measurement validity. There is this tendency for researchers to think that if you have a statistic that exceeds a particle threshold, then everything is okay. If you, the same statistic falls just below the threshold, then the study is worthless. So this kind of uh, yes or no thinking is not uh, ideal and uh, particularly you cannot really justify that kind of yes or no based on any good methodological resource. Many authors tend to cite Nunali's book on psychometric theory for the rule of thumb of 0.7 for Cronbach's alpha which is uh, or coefficient alpha which is a reliability statistic. Well the problem is that he doesn't make that kind of claims in his book. Instead reliability is something that you have to uh, take into consideration. If your study measures are 80% reliable, sometimes that is enough, sometimes 80% is not enough. You have to explain to your reader what does it mean. So what kind of bias do you expect if you have 70% reliability? What kind of bias do you expect if you have 95% reliability? Is it a problem or not? It is not a fact matter of exceeding a certain cutoff. Instead, it is a matter of understanding what reliability means for your results and then explaining that to your readers. So what, before, before we talk about these actual statistics, it is important to understand uh, what kind of assumptions that, that the reliability statistics are based on and what is the principle of assessing reliability. With the bathroom scale example that I used in a previous video, it is very simple. You uh, measure the same person again with the same scale. If you get the same result, then your measure is reliable. When we measure people or organizations through surveying people, for example, things are a bit more complicated. The reason is that if we ask a person whether uh, they like, for example, uh, United Nations, then uh, and we ask the person again if they like United Nations. The second answer to that question uh, is influenced by the previous answer. So if we ask the person the same question over and over, they will give us the same answer because that's how they answered the last time. So whereas a bathroom scale doesn't remember uh, what the previous measure was, people do and that's a problem. So uh, classical test theory has this concept of parallel tests. The idea of a parallel test is a hypothetical scenario where we would measure the same person again without that person having any recollection of the previous measurement or case. So an example here is that if we ask Mr. Brown whether he likes United Nations or not, then if we ha ask him the same question again, we have to brainwash Mr. Brown in between those two questions. So they are really independent tests of the same uh, attribute. This of course is a counterfactual argument because we cannot uh, brainwash our subjects. Our subjects will know what they answered the last time. So if we ask a survey question, we ask the next question, the, the, how the person answers the next question will be influenced by how they answered the first question. So we simply cannot ask the same question over and over. There are uh, two workarounds for this problem that we really cannot do these parallel tests. Test the same attribute of the same person at the same occasion uh, without the person having any recollection of being tested before. There are, the two ways are we either do actual replications and we assume that they are parallel. So uh, that will work if we have a time delay. For example, if we ask a person now whether they like United Nations, we ask them the same question a week after, then they may not remember anymore what the original answer was, in which case we could argue that those repeated measures uh, mimic the parallel tests scenario. Another uh, way is to assume that we do uh, we do two distinct measures. So we measure the same question uh, in a different, we measure the same attribute in a different way and we assume that those two different ways of measuring the same thing are parallel. So instead of asking uh, the person uh, 
whether he likes the United Nations or not. We could ask him uh, whether he thinks that the United Nations is the best thing that has ever happened to mankind, for example. So we uh, measure the same thing again, but slightly differently. So with that way, we could say that the second way, the second measurement is not as much influenced by the first measurement as it would be if we just repeated the same question over and over. The first approach um, by repeating the exact study, uh, exact measurement again with a time delay is called uh, test retest reliability. So the idea is that uh, if the, the, uh, the attribute that we are measuring is relatively stable over time, then if a person answers or tests differently at a different occasion, then the only reason for the difference between the two tests is unreliability because the trait is stable. And uh, also we have to make the assumption that errors are independent, which is justified by the time delay. So you don't remember what you answered the last time because there's a time delay. And uh, if we are uh, example here would be that if we uh, measure a child that wiggles, uh, if the measurements are done in a matter of seconds, the true weight does not change. We cannot uh, argue te test readers reliability in that case with, for example, one year's time delay. So we can't measure a child at five years and a child at six years and then say that the weights from those two measurements differ. That is evidence of unreliability. That would not be valid evidence of unreliability because we cannot assume that the trait is stable over such long period. So you have to consider uh, how quickly the trait or, or the thing that is being measured changes over time and how quickly people reset uh, by, by forgetting that they were tested and how exactly they answered the question in the first place. So that's test readers reliability. Uh, let's take a look at the example of test readers reliability from Ulyarenko's paper. They are say that they are asked slightly different question again with a two year delay on the key constructs. And uh, these uh, the study was about small companies and uh, the uh, two year delay of course here for that to be valid, you would have to assume that nothing changes when in small companies in two years time. That is of course uh, not a valid, valid uh, assumption. So uh, we can't make the assumption here that the trade doesn't change. So this would not be a valid test retest. It would be a valid if you do a survey or of a business organization, if there is like a two, two week or a month time delay, then you could reasonably assume that there are no major changes. But if you have a two year delay, like in this paper, then uh, that is not a very, very good test retest reliability estimate. So test retest uh, is you measure the same thing again with a time delay that is appropriate for your measure and the trade being measured so that uh, it allows people to reset between measurements but the trade doesn't really change substantially between the measurements. The, so this is uh, not as commonly used because of course if you uh, do two rounds of a survey study it is more expensive than to do just one round of a survey study. So we actually use a more commonly another way which is the distinct test. The reason for having multiple survey questions that look the same or look like they would measure the same thing is uh, the reason for that is that we actually think that they are distinct tests. So that's the most common reason for using multiple survey questions to measure the same thing. For example, we could ask uh, the company, uh, the person to rate whether the company is innovative or not, whether they are the technological leaders and in the, in the industry and whether they are the new first one to bring new product concepts to markets. We could argue that these are distinct questions. So they are you, you don't answer the same the second question similarly to the first question because these are really different questions. But they uh, do measure the same trait. That's the argument we have to make. So the idea of distinct tests is that uh, we, we generate tests that are not the same. So they're sufficiently different but we could still argue that they all measure the same thing. And how we use that data 
from these multiple distinct tests produces different ways of assessing reliability. So there is our internal consistency method, alternative forms method and split halves method. Understanding exactly what these all do is, is not important. It is important to understand the principle and then understand a couple of statistics that you can calculate from the data and then un understand their interpretations. The really important part here is that the t tests really have to be distinct. So uh, if you're just asking the same question over and over with slightly different wording, for example, our firm is very innovative, our company is very innovative and our business organization is very innovative. These are not distinct tests. It's just uh, asking the same question over and over with slightly different wording. And this is something that you see very commonly as a reviewer. So authors are just uh, writing questions that are the same without paying much attention to uh, the, uh, the distinctive, distinctiveness of these questions. And that's uh, a big, big problem that I see in management research.